Hi there, uh, I'm Graham Wakefield, this is Harry G, and together we make artificial natures. And um, well, first of all, we've, we're going to talk about those today, but first of all I want to say thank you to John McCormack and the Sensei Lab for inviting us and giving us this opportunity, uh, to So Jung Bang for starting this up, and for Katie Morrison for being so kind and patient uh, through the process, and I uh, really hope that we'll have a fruitful discussion uh, at the end. So. Um, so, in the simplest definition, artificial nature is AI for the making. To begin, let's see this circle as the world. And then once we see uh, the world, then our attention is naturally drawn to the center. Because um, the center has more resources, has more order, and are more elaborated, established. So it's easy to recognize. Then the people that um, that we observe that uh, people have a tendency toward um, the center. However, if we all try to go to the center, as artists, we are afraid that the world seems to get smaller. It's a bit like when uh, we're growing up, like uh, as kids, the world seems so large, but as we grow up, it seems to 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 shrink. But you know, of course, it never did shrink. So um, here's the world again, and uh, if we look to the edges. The world reveals uh, more and yeah. then... Feels greater. Um, yeah. And there are uh, the, these boundaries where we are really attracted uh, to. Um, um, some features of boundaries as membranes, there are more unknowns, m uh, more exchanges of uh, in and out, and then there are more hit, um, heterogeneity, diversity, or order and disorder and as a chaotic um, uh, status, where creation seems more abundant. It's, it's reminiscent of those liminal zones like coastal ecologies where you've got different ecosystems and different regimes kind of mixing together and these really interesting creative behaviors that are, that are happening there. Um, so from there, um, the, from the boundaries, it's easy to see it um, into other words, many words. Um, and especially um, as, a, as a speciations. And then we see speciation in nature is creation in culture. So uh, many words with many centers now, uh, it feels healthier and then more vibrant. And then in this way, we can see from the other, uh, instead of deadly fight over the center of one world. So this is our background and why we do what we do. Um, so this question, how can you know what we don't know? Um, through this expanding of the world, this question became very important to us. These days, it seems um, humans became arrogant because um, our tools became mighty. But that doesn't mean we are mighty, and instead it means uh, we tend to forget the vastness of what we don't know. In the past few years, we often ask people this question, um, is a real greater than the possible? What do you think? Yeah, so, um, so far, the answers um, um, can be varied. So it's for us that um, the real um, is greater. <laughs> it depends on um, where you put the unknown, in the possible or in the real. Um, if you thought that um, the possible, the, the, the imaginable, is um, bigger than the real, then probably you put the unknown into the possible. Uh, for us as artists, whatever we could think the possible, I believe the real is always weirder. Um, brings us back to our work through uh, the remake alien words. Yeah, this um, is the, kind of the reason why we, we we're making the uh, the strange and alien worlds in the first place. And just remembering that reality always has this weight of numbers over whatever we can imagine. Um, so. so since 2007, uh, as a collaborative project, uh, we produced, uh, we pursued this trajectory, uh, these questions, uh, by creating a family of artificial natures. Um, these are uh, interactive art installations that uh, surround people with biologically inspired complex systems experienced in different kinds of immersive mixed reality. 
Um, and our invitation through most is to become is, is for people to become part of an alien ecosystem, rich in living feedback networks, uh, but never as the central subject. As art practice, uh, we are motivated by the experience of discovering species in an unknown environment, akin to childhood memories in nature that engender an aesthetic integration of artful play and playful wonder mixed with attention of the unfamiliar. We are also deeply motivated to explore the creative potential of a computational environment that draws more from nature's sense of open-ended continuation than any rational, rational sense of utilita uh, utilitarian closure. Artificial nature is a form of computational generative art creating artificial life ecosystems as immersive worlds. Um, sometimes it's uh, easier to describe with a diagram. So these diagrams show how it sits between different fields of knowledge and practice. Um, So here you can see some selective artificial nature projects again. And for the rest of the presentation, we're going to talk about several of these works in particular uh, in order to explore the, the, these more abstract themes of artificial nature uh, in a bit more depth. We'll start uh, by thinking through interactive system art and infinite feedback um, using the work uh, Time of Doubles, which was first exhibited in 2011. So what you're hearing here uh, is the sound of the creatures. We'll turn it down in a moment. So Time of Doubles realizes um, the coexistence of multiple doubles in mirrored worlds in which organisms grow and adapt to an environment in part shaped by you, where your body influences currents of the wind while you're Virtual self is consumed by creatures. So this is the local telematics. The people are, um, from like the, each side, they um, each side they can't see each other, but they can see each other from this virtual world. So these are some exhibition records. So we talked about the sound briefly, but um, in general, uh, for most of the artificial natures, we've used algorithmic approaches to, uh, to the sound of the works, uh, generating sound at microsonic timescales so that we could fluidly reflect subtle changes in the ongoing simulation in a, in a very parallel way and in a, in a very temporally detailed way. Um, in time of doubles in particular, the agents use a granular process that's inspired by uh, cricket trains, little uh, cricket chirps, little pulse trains, uh, which are spatialized um, when they make really good direction and distance cues to reveal properties of the world at multiple levels of detail. And as the populations grow and collapse, the soundscape develops from these isolated, localized pulses to these dense clouds of sound whose uh, timbres vary with the, uh, with the evolving gene pool. We've also, uh, through Time of Doubles, we started uh, working with uh, meta programming so that we could generate unique behaviors for each agent or each creature, uh, gen generating the programs from genetic information. And because each agent program is different, we've been using dynamic co generation and just in time compilation uh, to machine code for each agent in turn. 
Um, in this way, the, the creatures can uh, adapt to extract inferences from the complex world in which they're immersed. But evolution in this kind of ecosystemic approach um, features an endogenous selection criterion. So the creatures, um, there's no forced fitness function over the whole thing. The creatures just have to maintain enough energy levels to survive and reproduce. And that makes it different from something that's steered by some sort of an extrinsic desire or something that's e actively directed by users. So it's important to us that this network, the, the complex network of feedback relations in the world uh, envelops the, the visitor, that it includes the human uh, into the system, um, it, both in display and interaction, bringing the generative capacity of computation into an experiential level that's reminiscent of, but different to the open-endedness of the natural world. So we've been using continuous and indirect modes of interaction, like the depth cameras and the point clouds, where possible. Uh, preferring um, ways of having interactions between elements that have multiple parallel channels uh, and certainly are bidirectional, so that there's no kind of symbolic cause and effect kind of process going on. So the, if you follow through the diagram, there's no beginning, there's no end, and there's no center. There's no privileged position in this ontology, although there are many significant differences within them. So in terms of this um, embedded feedback, um, I would like to talk about interactive systems um, here a little more. So um, the diagrams on the left are from Konog and Edmunds um, discussing the emergence of interactive art in 1973, a time in which the spectators became participants. The first diagram um, is a more like a traditional art system, a static system, uh, in which spectators just read the artwork. And in B, uh, time and environment factor into the artwork, so the artwork changes in time. But the directional nature uh, remains, like earth art. With C, uh, finally spectators became participants, able to influence or change the artwork, like happening, or the, the, com the early uh, computational media art. I um, encountered these diagrams in 2011 in the context of um, interactive media arts, much of which uh, seemed more reactive to me, in which a visitor uh, rather disembodied figures out how to trigger the response of the artwork with not much more freedom to engage with it beyond. That's what made me sketch this diagram on the top right. Um, but thinking through what an interactive dynamic artwork could be, I thought first the engagement should have a deeper feedback. Uh, but also that the participant is not outside of the environment, but richly embedded in it. It made me focus more on the participants as a dynamic system. So you can see the, the, like the, the, the uh, right, the A diagram is it's weak, uh, the influence from the participant. So it made it more like a reactive system, um, reactive dynamic system. Um, and then B, you can see now, like I moved the environment to participant to show my aware, or awareness as participant as a dynamic system. And then this idea developed. Um, so, of course, it got more complex as I tried to follow all the paths of feedback by observation um, on the left. Um, but a few years later, it became clearer through an ecosystem perspective, seeing both the artwork and the participant as complex systems of self regulating, recursive dynamics in relation with each other. Um, so we can see um, they begin to look more similar on the same plane. So in 2014, like I drew it again, and then now you can see the, the, uh, the, the how it kind of uh, the, um, interrupt, the system became the, like the shape became the same. And um, so by this thinking through diagrams, which got complex for a while, um, we found ourselves at this rather simple result. Um, so the artificial nature and physical world, if um, I just show this diagram to you, then, then many people might uh, wonder that how they can be the same. Like here, like I kind of made the, the kind of their scale um, ontologically, they are the same. 
um, but uh, with these processes that, of course, they are different, but structurally deeply resonant. And for us, it is very clear that, again, ontologically, they are flat. Uh, we think this membrane creates respect and affection, too, and then that became the very important to um, the rule when we create our work. And then our work is intentionally plural. Um, here is the space configuration which makes possible multiple doubles in mirror doors. The architectural scale S curve screen is a, is a flat world as a door or window to the virtual world, but actually it holds the um, equivalent amount of physical space into it. So you can see from the diagram, like a down, uh, down right. The double-sided nature of the membrane is further doubled as each hub presents a new view of the same world in which visitors on both sides of the screen are present. So it was really interesting to, to create um, as a membrane between the physical space into the virtual space. Um, for the next series of works, we would like to focus on the use of mixed reality as a method of shared, playful, and open-ended complexity in hybrid spaces between human and non-human beings. So we will start from Archipelago. Mm -hmm. So in uh, Archipelago, which you can see here, the video at the top is uh, uh, a view of the work. The video at the bottom demonstrates a little bit how it was uh, designed and put together. And in this piece, we projected an ecosystem from above onto a landscape of three tons of sand. Um, the, the, we had ceiling mounted depth cameras uh, that would detect the landscape's topography and then they could shape the adaptive conditions uh, for the species that were inhabiting it. These cameras also detect humans and they know where your shadows fall. Um, so here interactions are both um, destructive and constructive. Your shadow destroys the vegetation underneath at the base of the foot web. You became a force of death and life, like a wildfire or dancing shiva. The desolation is followed by great fertility. But if you feel you are a god to the virtual world, you are far from omnipotent. Interaction is nuanced in response, but your influence is limited. So in 2014, uh, we had another chance to exhibit this work at uh, Le Gaite Lyrique in Paris as part of the Capitaine Futur exhibition. And um, for this, we evolved the work somewhat. And particularly to deepen the mixed reality, we redesigned the installation to use uh, a clay-based sand that doesn't get dry. So uh, visitors could then reshape the topography uh, and even create and destroy uh, new islands. As visitors reach down to touch the land, they can also see these, uh, these alien creatures creep onto their hands. And then they'll, they'll see that they'll be able to lift those creatures up and carefully transport them to deposit them in some other regions or islands, uh, or just drop them to their oblivion. There was no um, instructions in the exhibition here saying that, that this was possible. Um, uh, the, it was there was a beautiful moment when I was just sitting there after after we finished installing this I was just taking a break and seeing somebody walk in and interact with it and they put their hand down and the creature crawled on and they lifted it up I guess just intuitively but not expecting to be able to do it and then the guy's face was like ah when he saw that this thing was following him so, so here um, uh, the only text. Uh, other than the title, the only text that was uh, given in the exhibition uh, was this bestiary. Um, this was the idea uh, of uh, Jos Auzand, the curator of the exhibitions. Um, we really liked the discussion with her about the direction of this exhibition. It was very non-didactic but experience-driven kind of art science, which resonated with our notion of waking up in an alien forest. Um, to explain a little bit about the, the relations between uh, this species, then um, uh, there's um, a pulsation, a pulsating 
uh, lichen like layer of biomass modeled by cellular automata begins the food chain, sustaining several species of motile organisms that display various foraging, scavenging, predatory, and social behaviors, including swarming, nesting, and pheromone trail, uh, trail marking. So in a way, this kind of um, uh, the style of uh, non-didactic art science continued with our next exhibit, uh, which was actually at a children's science museum in California. And again, we wanted to envelop visitors with this biologically inspired complex systems in a physical space and bring the generative capacity of computation into a human scale. Um, but it was also important to us that this doesn't privilege a single view. So um, in Habitat's world, uh, it kind of awaits you, awaits your playful engagement uh, with three different ways to see uh, with other eyes. Uh, this was our um, previous design for the installation. Because we were in Toronto designing remotely for an installation in California, we started using VR and a game engine to visualize the space in a way that we could experience it firsthand. So you can see here are the three perspectives of one world. And here's in Habitat. So at the macro scale, the super personal um, perspective, like Archipelago, the entire world is experienced as this projection map landscape that forms the centerpiece of the exhibit. Visitors can wander freely around the landscape, observing and listening to the behaviors of the alien creatures that inhabit it. The interactions are very similar to uh, Archipelago as well. In the second person perspective at the mesoscale, scale, uh, a view of the world is projected onto the museum wall behind. And this presents um, a third person perspective as it follows uh, one creature at a time. In this particular case, we're uh, following um, a yellow uh, predator creature that's probably about to get some lunch here, I think. There he goes. They were very popular, <laughs> those creatures. And then finally, uh, by donning uh, a virtual reality head mounted display, visitors uh, could enter the world in first person. But now they're shrunken to a size of 25 times smaller. So whereas with the sculpture, the creatures look like tiny insects, uh, suddenly in this perspective, they're larger than you. Uh, they move faster than you. Moreover, when you look up and around the, uh, around the space, you'll also see the, the shadow meshes of, of the other people uh, visiting the exhibition as they're looking over the space where you're now embedded. That's a, that's a monster giant. Oh, I think I missed the last bit, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, a question stays in our mind. How would one communicate with an alien? Our closest examples are young children and animals. Children by nature are more readily explorers of stranger worlds, especially of worlds before language. Where words are yet lacking, participatory play becomes more vibrant. So it is not enough to see through another's eyes, we must engage with each other. So from August 2017 through to January 2018, uh, the exhibit was open seven days a week. Um, and the museum estimates that they received around 65,000 visitors. Uh, pretty much half of those were under 13 years of age. 
we received um, accounts from the staff members who were managing the exhibit of uh, children often coming back again and again and staying for several hours. They also shared some really interesting anecdotes with us, and we also we managed to get some while we were there as well. Uh, the, for yeah. example, um, at a, the, um, the restaurant, because we have been really busy to work, so um, I'm mean, just okay. At the restaurant, that we, well, we are eating the, the meal, and then there was a one girl came in, and then like, she didn't know like we were artists to make uh, to who who made the, the artwork, but uh, she visited like table to table and said like, did you see this is the amazing work? And then like the, if you didn't see, it, you must see it. And I was like, <laughs> it was the most real, uh, like the most real thing. Mm. moment to us yeah we saw kids um like parents would be saying oh this is what's happening and that thing is going on that that creature's because again there's no instructions on the wall right the explaining to the kids how things work and the kids are watching and saying no no dad you're wrong it's like this it's like this um and they'd be making their own stories and uh making their own games uh through the whole space parents often thought that the work was too complicated uh but the kids had no problem with it um, and they'd also be worrying about talking about death and, 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 you know, and devastation. Again, the kids had no problem engaging with this. Uh, we saw kids, particularly, we saw kids looking at the uh, collapsing shadows and relating it to the wildfires that were happening uh, literally down the street at the, at, at the same time. And also, actually, it was very impressive that they found like, new games. Mm -hmm. um, out of it, like for example, they kind of stayed long enough to become the mountain, mm -hmm. and they let like uh, their friend, uh, like one using of their VR. friends, yeah. uh, using the VR, and they let uh, let him or her kind of kind of fall down from the like big mountain over their body, like something like that. So the they yeah. created all, all like different games, and that was really uh, very intriguing to mm -hmm. us. Oh, yeah, this one is, uh, I just uh, wanted to share some sunshine in the process of making the work. Um, how to, and also, how to build a large sculpture in a week. So, in Habitat, led to in superposition in the Deja uh, Media Biennale, um, for which we were very grateful to the Daejeon City Museum and their curators for offering this amazing space. Um, and here the island became many islands, many worlds, um, uh, very much inspired by uh, Galapagos. And so again, this piece is focusing on the plurality of the views. Often we're mistrusting the human capacity to see real natural holes throughout the blind spots of abstract representations and our preference for linear ABC kinds of narratives. It's hard to understand the complexity of a whole ecosystem in most of its relations and flows from a logic of singular views. So, in superposition, realizes this coexistence of multiple worlds as multiple ways of being, again, in first person, second person, and in personal perspectives, and also unveils experience at different scales of space and time. The world welcomes you, but also thrives without you. You can become part of the ecosystem, but you're not in a singular role and you're not the main subject. Oh, and then the the difference with the uh, inhabited with this in superposition, the back wall projection as a met, uh, metal scale, um, slit scan, uh, slit scan uh, perspective, that operates at a much lower rate of real time, like that of trees or plants, and we wanted to express that. Here, the movements of human visitors are so rel uh, relatively fast; they pass often as simple black blips but in real time. So you can see maybe from here more mm -hmm. at the, the right top. Um, we all learn through play, like art. Play makes use of any medium at hand, like life. Play makes and breaks rules to keep itself going. Nothing is outside the play for long. However, for our work, it is not only our playfulness that is important, but also their playfulness. For the future, we are looking forward to finding how near living systems may be curious about us and may play with us. So can they like us? So that, that, that's a, a what we are working at the moment. So here you can see um, the, the making processes, and it was really nice that uh, we could work with many people in the like kind of large installation scene. And then thanks to especially to Nico, Alex, and Michael, and then they came um, from Canada to South Korea to help us. It was a really fun experience.
So for the uh, for the last piece in this series, uh, we'd like to introduce um, uh, conservation of shadows, which adds a, a new direction to this uh, trajectory of shared realities. I briefly want to talk about VR here a bit. I mean, we've been using VR uh, in our exhibits for quite a while, but there were some things about it that still made us feel uneasy. In particular, when VR can be viewed practically anywhere, and wherever you are viewing it, how can it avoid some inherent sense of disconnection to where you are? You're taken somewhere else. So instead, in this work, we wanted to connect the VR deeply to the specific site and the specific context. So it's not just about being there in the VR sense, but also in being there. In this case, the there is Sema Chang'o, um, a recently acquired expansion of the Seoul Museum of Art, uh, which is on the former site of the Korea Center for Disease Control. Um, our work tried to respond to this very specific history of the host venue through a central conception of shadows as a shared physical image between visible and invisible worlds. As a historical building, it has a great balance between order and disorder. Sunshine changes tones of the space. We imagined unknown new beings growing, fond of the wet texture of old wood, the fragrance of sunshine smeared between cracks, and the quietness of murmuring and whispering. To let them live, we extended senses to mixed realities surrounded by softly ringing bells and the crunch of salt underfoot. Motor actuated miniature bells surround the installation space, hanging down from the rafters at different locations and heights, varying in intensity and creating a variegated spatial sonic experience whenever invisible beings pass by. So we can see it's right now, like we don't see those invisible species, but they just passed and then moved to the back. So the heart of this piece is this physicality of shadows as a liminal bridge suspended between superposed physical and virtual spaces in both mathematical and also mythological senses. The floor of this room is laden with a carpet of 330 kilos of salt and visitors feel the grain shifting and crunching underfoot with each step as they progress into the environment. We all have our shadows and we share them with the beings. And those that are in VR, they haven't left this place, and they haven't lost their bodies, nor have they lost their shadows. Instead, in VR we find an alternative perspective in which our bodies have become the shadows around which the other beings play. By donning the head matter display, visitors take on this alternative perspective to see a world coexisting in superposition to ours. Um, and what first appeared as flat shadows are unveiled to be these uh, translucent membranes of creatures moving around and through our now shadowy bodies and shaped by our movements and gestures. You can also sense the shadow volumes of other visitors to the space. Uh, feeling a bit like knowing someone is with you in a dark room. In a living environment that is increasingly saturated with computational agency, which is also becoming more visually and spatially aware, and in which there is no longer as clear a divide between the perceptions of the body and the spirit, our response is to give life to mixed reality as a way to explore how we may coexist with digital beings in ways that are mutually more abundantly curious playful and meaningfully rewarding. So this is going to be the last point for, for our presentation. And it, uh, it's about letting the future be a future. 
And we're going to talk about this through work Infranet, which represents uh, new directions. Um, in particular, like many other researchers, we're working with AI, but um, in, in perhaps an unconventional way. So this is in front of New York, the most recent artificial nature installation. Compared to our previous works, this shows three new directions. The first, we use real-world open data rather than generative data as before. Second, we set the scale to the size of a city. Third, we use unsupervised evolutionary neural networks, which differs from the mainstream use of machine learning using supervised training. At its heart, Infranet is a speculative proposition of the data of a city as a habitat for new forms of life. Infranet has exhibited in three cities internationally, Gwangju, Korea, New York, USA, or Vancouver, Canada. Each exhibit of Infranet utilizes public data available on the host city. The data of a city became a habitat for new forms of life. Today, overwhelming quantities of data invisibly overflow the world and the city. Here we found the double abstract alienation. First, the artificial creatures. It's alienated double of life forms as we know them. And the city data is an abstract double of the city to reveal certain patterns. To invite alien creatures into our city data as a double alienation gave us strangely a fulfilling satisfaction. Here, our inter interest in data is not to answer predetermined human-centric questions, but rather for the intrinsic texture and qualities of the data in its own right. In comparison to the mainstream machine learning scene, in which problems are often easily expressed in advance, our approach focuses more on the open-ended and dynamic problem spaces, which seem more like real experiences. So it's a site-specific work again. Um, we use a variety of geospatial data of uh, each designated city. Uh, focusing on um, regions and especially pathways um, largely of flow, flows of water, flows of electricity, flows of transit, um, flows of life. Uh, we gather data from open government sources, open street map, digital elevation, map data, things like that. They, it includes things like footpath networks, electricity grids, uh, pollution levels, wastewater networks, cultural centers, locations of violence, homeless shelters, water fountains, all kinds of stuff. But none of this source data itself is directly displayed. Rather, what we're seeing are only the mobile creatures and the traces that they leave in the space. And as they move, these creatures leave these dynamic trails, and just thus they're drawing out their own particular umbelt. The creatures are excitable, they're curious, they take up ideas contagiously through entrainment and horizontal gene transfer. We'll talk about it in a second. They make links with others nearby, forming clusters that ex exchange activations, and thus they can create an endlessly dynamic second-order spatial network through which these associations uh, can spread. kind of have to mention, we had no idea, but uh, right at the moment uh, that we were um, exhibiting uh, this piece, uh, it was the, the first COVID-19 infections were beginning to spread <laughs> through New York. And, um... So the depth of living behavior in an ecosystem is deeply dependent on the qualities of an environment, of the environment that it inhabits. A vibrant and diverse ecosystem requires an environment that is rich with niches and interestingly non-uniform distributions. A good space in which there's many ways to make a living. A sufficiently complex landscape for the capacity of variety to be discovered. And we think that geospatial data has this kind of richness. But to take advantage of it, life also needs to have a requisite variety to match it. That is, it needs to be able to generate a repertoire of responses that are at least as nuanced as the opportunities in the environment. 
if either of these factors, uh, the, the variety of the environment and the variety of the adaptation, is unfulfilled, a system can produce a monoculture of less interest, uh, confining us to a narrative of the world as we know it, rather than a system story that is more creative and open-ended. So for this purpose, we've adopted these neural networks with dynamic topology in an evolutionary simulation that is unsupervised and without objective. It's not utilitarian and highly liquid through social exchange, um, inspired by non-human forms of collective and adaptive intelligence. So typically, um, uh, infranets supporting a population of, uh, of, of, of around 8,000 creatures. To survive, these creatures simply have to detect some data, uh, the existence of data, as well as the traces of other creatures. Uh, otherwise, they're free. There's, that is, the only objective or the only fitness function here is the need to verify your existence in the world and that you're not alone. The creature's antenna read the underlying data, but they're also highly limited sensors. They have a taste or a bias that filters out most of the data. These filtered sensations feed into the neural network and output the creature behavior. They also feed into the, the, the color that, in, that we see. In machine learning, neural network structures are usually fixed and uh, designed to match a specific problem, but living systems don't have a specific problem to solve. There's no particular topology that best fits all, so for InfraNet, each creature's neural network is distinct structurally, not just in, in terms of their weights. Uh, they're small, there may be a hundred neurons plus feedback, uh, but they can still lead to rich behavior. And also, unlike uh, traditional approaches, the creatures exchange these networks continuously through their lifetime. Whenever you see a pulsing line between uh, two of the creatures, there's a high chance that they're also doing an exchange of their neural structures. This exchange is not perfect, it includes mutations, um, it's, but it's modeled on the idea of horizontal gene transfer that it in, occurs in microbial quasi-species. It's a very fast way of adapt, adapting to an environment. Um, these creatures, they leave these trails and fogs as they move, the color of which represents their current taste and bias. The trails remain in place for a long time, a kind of a long-term memory etched into the space that gradually desaturates and evaporates. Um, the fogs disperse more widely but more quickly, more like a short-term memory, revealing how they pulsate and exchange with each other. And the creatures pulsate, like neural spike trains, uh, which also determines their speed. It's easier to see with the sped up video. Um, they attempt to synchronize with their nearest neighbors, like flashing fireflies, and since they're moving, their neighborhood is continuously changing, so the pulsations never stabilize. Instead, you get these linear, circular, and spiral waves that can be seen through the population. The low activation creatures are more likely to take on the taste or the color, the bias, uh, of, a, of a differently tasting neighbor, which creates another kind of contagion. So to close our presentation, uh, again, we find it easier to talk through uh, one of our works under this current. Uh, first, art is a human activity always seeking inspirations and relations from and within nature. And um, here, the interest in boundaries uh, or influenced by boundaries, the great interest um, in the boundary help us to create what is possible and help us to redefine the relations between nature, human, and art with newer contemporary perspectives. Our invitation has been always to the creative exploration of a possible world as an expanded boundary of the rear. While being aware of this infinite feedback and connections in the world as a system, like again that um, no dead end, the, all the connections to, to every to every component. So here is Andrew's current. We are bringing this possible alien world so that we can alienate our world first, and then seek what the possible and the real in our own in the process. Um, creating our cultural environment, which we are continuously adapting to. Therefore, it is to shape us to what we want to become. So here uh, with our third member, Ina, 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much.